So, um, today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how do you combine a high performance data platform, uh, which is great for transactions, uh, and also perform analytics on it. Um, for those of you who have, you know, let me ask a question. How many of you have heard of Aero Spike before today? Okay, about 10%, 20%. Um, so, so for those, those of you who uh, are not familiar with it, with it about five years ago, um, um, uh, Brian and I, Brian is my co-founder, Brian and I founded, founded this company uh, in order to deal with the problem of high-performance lead write transactions um, that we thought was going to become really important uh, in the area of big data. Uh, and that's essentially, uh, this whole presentation is um, partly uh, the technology, what the technology we've invented, but also about our story as to how the whole market developed and so on. So feel free to ask me any questions uh, as we go on. I'll get this thing right. Okay, so uh, the whole motivation uh, for uh, products like ours, you know, uh, systems like Aerospike, is the um, essential growth of the internet. The the key things about um, the internet, you know, enterprise is how much these enterprises have to delight their customers, and and the customers are generally impatient. They do not want to wait, and uh, it's kind of a well-known um, fact that if customers, you know, if a particular website gets about 20% slower, then very soon, they don't just lose 20% of their customers, they lose all of them to some other site. And this is something which Google and Facebook and so on have kind of uh, used to train people, you know. In fact, to the extent that recently I've been talking with folks from financial services, and those CIOs are, uh, essentially, what they're telling me is, uh, Google has spoiled all our customers. So now everybody wants, even on a financial website, uh, to have the kinds of vitality that you see on the internet applications. Uh, so this is actually something, uh, you know, uh, extremely important uh, to address uh, if enterprises have to succeed in the new, e new era. Now the service here can never go down, and that's kind of a key part of this. You know, here's a list of all the inter enterprises. I've liberally used it, you know, um, uh, pick them from Aeros by customers, but you know you can see uh, they're all you know well known in terms of uh, folks in uh, in India. You know there's Comly, there's Pubmatic, uh, there's Visuri. You know uh, there's also Inmobi. You know these are all people who have used our product, but also they are all also pioneers in their own right on the internet over various. You know they use lots of other interesting technology also. So. Before I go into exactly what is this technology and how we do transactions and analytics, uh, let's take a look at the entire database landscape. You know, I'm an old-time database person who actually worked in the area of you know uh, transactions as well as a little bit in you know analytics in the old days. And what we have now is a counterpart on the right side, which essentially is transactions on the right top, and then on the, on the right on the bottom part of the right side, you have the big data analytics, just Hadoop and so on. A lot of this analysis, you know, if you look at the whole uh, evolution of this market, uh, in the original, you know, like 30 years old database um, kind of um, the database kind of inventions, uh, the OLTP databases came first, followed by the OL, o OLAP ones, as they're called. Now, the reverse actually happened uh, in the new era. You know, there's been a lot more uh, analytics and uh, in terms of Hadoop and so on, which happen, happened before the NoSQL or the you know, real-time big data actually took off. And the interesting thing about the real-time uh, transaction space where, you know, for example, we and Aerospike have been pretty much uh, part of uh, is uh, the, the importance of reads and writes. Uh, and also have 24 by 7 availability and when you and, and running transactions at high throughput and low latency. So all of these create a whole bunch of interesting uh, problems which you know which I'll talk about as to how we solve those. One marketing slide, obligatory one. Um, it, you know, Gartner, for example, has been doing analysis of these spaces. And if you look at this whole quadrant, you know, you, you can probably not see it very clearly. But there's a whole bunch of the NoSQL uh, players like, you know, Datastax, Couchbase, Mongo are all here. If you look at Aerospike, it is alone in the, in, you know, what is called the visionary quadrant. You, know, you can hardly see it, but I'll, I'll, I'll post these slides so you can see it. So why is it that we are visionary? So it's something you will probably, hopefully, you'll get a sense of as we go through this talk. Typically, uh, what, what does the real-time database deployment look like? You know, today, uh, if you look at any of our customers, or for that matter, anybody on the internet, you know, it doesn't have to be an aerospace customer. If you just look at them, what they do is they do a bunch of analysis, um, and then 
analysis is essentially done uh, in terms of a batch process. They took out all the data, typically look at logs, look at user behavior. They generate a bunch of data. And then they generate what is called user profiles or certain behavior information and stick it into a front-end database. Okay, and then at the time, a user is actually at their website you know, there is, a, for example, if you take real-time bidding, you know, every time you, you know, any of you go to a website, there is, you know, they're actually auctioning us. Okay, each of us get auctioned, saying, you know, there is this person, you know, um, who is, you know, if it's Srini, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm there. Uh, Srini has arrived on the website, or, you know, or Sunil, you know, our head of the Bangalore office, you know, he's arrived on the website, and then they say, okay, you know, Srini is interested in fast cars, you know, Srini is interested in fast bikes or whatever, and they actually figure those things out, and then they will show you ads, and not only that, they are able to kind of decide what has Srini been looking at in the last week. You know, maybe I've been looking at, uh, you know, flights to, you know, somewhere, or maybe I was looking, my, my son is in college, so maybe I'm looking at something related to, you know, a computer I want to buy or, or a phone. You know, they actually know all of that, and then they'll show you uh, things which are relevant. Now, this is not, so if you look at search advertising and what Google has actually pioneered, you know, search advertising, the context is there in what people type in, okay? But display advertising, as it's called, you don't have the context except by what people do. And so you have to observe the people and see what their behavior is. And you have to decide it at the time that they are at the website. And that's what makes this thing interesting. So this real-time access has to happen within the 50 to 100 milliseconds so that they can actually capture the attention of the user who is at the website at that time. But you cannot do a whole bunch of analysis at the time, but the analysis happens before, and the appropriate segment information or whatever other kinds of information, behavior information gets stored here. Algorithms get written so that they can re get retrieve data which is relevant to that user, and maybe some nearby users, and then you can you know, very fast uh, be able to satisfy this. And there's a huge amount of money going. Okay, the interesting thing you have to realize is all of the uh, dis display advertising front ends are really revenue critical for the companies that they run them. If these things are down, they don't make money. So this is extremely critical. That even though, you know, if you look at financial services and banks and so on, if their systems go down, they don't make money, but they actually trade in much higher val you know, value if you're buying stock and so on. It, it's, you know, it, it's not going to be like, you know, uh, you know, a small amount of money. That's kind of the big difference. Okay, so these are all revenue critical too. I don't have to go there. I could use this. So what are the key challenges in building a system um, to actually tackle such internet applications? You know, here are a few, you know, these are the things we decided were important uh, when we started working on this project. Um, essentially, we have to handle high rates of read write transactions over persistent data. This is very important to note. If we did not have to handle high rates of read write transactions as demanded by the internet, existing old databases can do this. You know, MySQL can do quite fine, Oracle can do fine. That's exactly what, where the system was, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Now, all kinds of patchwork was done on these databases, including some by me when I was working in those, to essentially make them slightly better, slightly better. But the, the growth of the Internet has made this several orders of magnitude higher, and Moore's Law and whatever it is that you do isn't going to help by changing some basic algorithms. You have to actually rewrite the database in order to do things like that. You've got to avoid hotspots. In order to run a system which actually, you know, continues to run over time without problems, you have to avoid hotspots. You know, I don't know if uh, any of you have driven cross country or, you know, on a car or something and things kind of eventually, you know, if you drive long enough on a, on, a, on, a, on a car like that, it's going to break down somewhere because some weak link will be there which is, which is breaking first. So hot, that creates a hotspot. A hotspot actually is it's easy to create in, in an online system. Once it's created, it will bring the entire system down. It will not be localized and that's very important to avoid. Now, you got to provide, and this is something which comes from some of the database background, uh, you know, myself and some of us have in our company, you know, including Sunil. And what it is is we really believe that a database needs to keep data consistent. It is important to be uh, high performance. It's important to be scalable. It's important to be reliable and be up all the time. But what is most paramount to a database is the fact that it never loses data. And that makes things very difficult. If you look at some of the early kind of work done in NoSQL, if you look at the, the, even the Dynamo paper, the whole premise is, hey, if you want to get high performance and availability, we're going to kind of not give you consistency. We'll give you eventual consistency. And that's fine for a class of applications which is running the Internet. But if you have to cross over from Internet applications into, you know, standard enterprise applications where people, you know, lives run under, under you know, like banks, you know, networking, you know, telcos, for example, you really need to solve the consistency problem at high scale. The, the last three, the first three are application development. You want, to, you want to deal with all these points so applications are easy to write. And then, 
in the, the next three are about services and operations. You know, the, the bane of the databases running for long times is that you have to do maintenance tasks, you have to actually rebalance indexes, you have to move data, you have to add nodes in clusters. All of that, those are long running tasks. And they interfere with short running read write transactions. You know, the, the, the kind of transaction I talked about where a user is at a website and you have to tell within a few milliseconds where the user, what the user is doing so you can show them an advertisement, for example. That kind of stuff gets in the way if, you're, if your system is now, uh, you just added 10 nodes to the cluster and you're now simply moving all the data around. What happens to these transactions? How slow do they get? The important thing is not to get them to, to be slower than what is acceptable. And, and that you can, you know, we proved kind of that you can do this over time. This is important. The scaling linearly is, of course, you know, it's a given, right? I mean, you want to add nodes, you want to scale. You know, the last thing you want to do is, you know, when, once you add a node, if, you know, you, you, you know, you just don't want to um, be in a situation where you create a bottleneck because this moving data around just doesn't work well. So adding capacity with no service interruption, that's, a, that's another critical thing. These services that we're talking about in the internet, the internet never sleeps, it never stops, it never goes down. You don't know when the, when the spike is going to come. You know, uh, you, you're just going to have to deal with it. Okay? So, so I'm going to first, the first part of the talk, uh, you know, I gave you some overview. Now I'm going to spend the next part um, on uh, how do we do the read-write small transactions with 100% uh, uptime. And the, Okay, so that looks like an earthquake or something. So I'm from California, so I'm very sensitive. We should all dive under the table. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, it looks like it stopped. So, um, what the next thing is, so, so, so I'm going to talk about how to, how to actually have a system which, you know, performs high, uh, throughput, uh, read write transactions. And then we're going to talk about how to extend that to do hot analytics, as I call it, analytics on your read write data. So, the basic idea here is to make sure that a system never goes down by keeping, by keeping copies of data and, you know, all over the place, right? That's, that's kind of the fundamental thing. But how do you do that? So the way we have kind of split the problem is we've, we've built clusters which are tightly coupled, as we call them. So this is important because the important thing is um, the, each of the cluster nodes are identical. So we can just add a new node and it will join the cluster. We make sure that data is replicated synchronously within the cluster. And it is not, that's not enough. So there's a cluster, let's say, in a data center in Bangalore, okay? Now, you want to have a data center, let's say, in Singapore, uh, to have some level of, um, you know, uh, availability. Let the Bangalore one goes down, you know, uh, you know, there's a power outage or whatever happens, you know. Uh, and then what happens, or an earthquake like today. So the point is, uh, what happens is uh, that particular cluster goes away, then the other cluster needs to be able to work. And that's basically what we did. We basically, we built a robust single cluster situations where you can have synchronous replication. So if you have nodes going down within a cluster here, uh, we will be continue to run safely. And then if the whole cluster goes down, you're able to go across. So that's what is shown here. You know, this is a, basically one of the first deployments we did with what is called our cross data center solution developed out of Bangalore, actually. Um, and essentially what, what we did was, you know, this one cluster at Amsterdam, another one at Ohio, another one in Texas, another one in San Jose. And there are, if you look at it, there are different kinds of rings here. Some data can move to all four clusters. Some data is replicated only in two of them. Others are replicated in, you know, three of them. So all of these flexibilities are important to run such a system. So this is how we kind of uh, slice the whole pie, you know. Synchronous replication within the cluster with homogeneous nodes and asynchronous replica replication across data centers. And that actually works and solves the, the practical problems of most of the deployments. Now, how do we actually distribute it so that we don't have hotspots? Now, it's important to have a really robust hash function when we do, you know, to eliminate hot, hotspots. If you think of it, you know, at the Aerospike uh, primary index is basically a DHT, a distributed hash table. And what we use is the RIPMD160 hash function, which to, to this point has no known collisions. So there's a whole uh, paper, papers written on this kind of stuff. So what that means is you can hash virtually anything and you will not see the same, you know, the digest of, you know, uh, of the key is going to be different. And that's kind of really valuable for us. In fact, we use it by not actually storing the key at all in the database. Um, and then we have added a feature uh, for, um, you know, adding, for storing the key if, if, the, if the user, you know, if, if, the, if the user want to be really sure. You know, for the financial transaction thing, uh, you just want to keep the key also. We, we can also do that. But it is typically not necessary for, uh, you know, advertising use cases and so on. Now, the hash has, you know, once we, you know, the way the system works is we take, we take the key, we essentially produce the hash, and then once we have the hash, we, 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 we have, we can have what is called a partition ID. 
So the key space is split into some number of partitions. You know, in our case, it's about 4K partitions. And once we have the key space you know, split into 4,000 partitions, we can then map randomly a partition to a node. So what, this, what is showing, shown here below here is a table. Uh, essentially, it is called, uh, you know, it maps partitions to nodes. Okay, the partition map table, as it's called, um, essentially uh, distributes the partitions in, in, in a kind of a uniform way across these nodes. Now, if you wanted to store more than two copies, the table shown here is essentially a two-copy uh, system. Now, if you wanted to store more than two copies, there'll be one more column here, which will tell you what nodes the third copy of this particular partition is in. And the whole algorithm works seamlessly. Yes, yes. The, so, so the, the way uh, the question was, uh, uh, is the partition ID uniformly distributed across nodes? Now, the way, way it works is, if you look at this table here, if you go down a column, you see a, a node actually appears, uh, you know, equal number of times for that particular column. Okay. So, so the number of partitions in a node is uh, approximately, you know, one by n, where n is the number of nodes in the cluster. Okay. That's actually a great question. Uh, our clusters uh, are typically between 1 to 100. So, yes. No, this will not scale in terms of the number. But the way you, then what you do is you just have, uh, you know, the 20,000 partitions and you're done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're going to do a cluster of that size, which might actually be necessary if you want to do a petabyte database, uh, we are basically in the, you know, uh, dozens of terabytes size, and, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we store data, so you will see how within, uh, you know, a hundred node cluster, you can actually get a pretty, uh, you know, pretty much you can handle all of, uh, you know, uh, North America's ad traffic in, in like a six node cluster. <laughs> so some of these things are really powerful. Uh, real time, okay, so what, what do we have to do in order to make sure that we write with immediate consistency, right? I talk about immediate consistency and you have nodes in the cluster. So if you end up having a master and a replica, what will happen is a write is sent to the row master. So we've already split it into partitions. So given a key, we can hash it to the digest, determine the partition, and once we know the partition, we look at the partition map, we know which node the master is in, and then which node the replica is in, right? So, so the write goes to the master, uh, and then we do locks, you know, we do record locking, you know, just like, you know, classic databases do. So if there are multiple writes coming in for the same record, they will serialize themselves. Uh, it's, that's important. And then the write is done synchronously to the memory copy of the master and also in memory on the replica. It's done synchronously. That's important. And then you basically come back, uh, you know, you queue the operations to disk and then it go back to the client. So the fact that the, so the client will only get a, an act saying it's okay if both the copies are written. That's important. Um, and in terms of, and, and that's kind of the classic write case. Now what happens when you add a node? Now that is actually a much harder case because when you add a node, uh, you have to continue the transactions and the cluster will discover the other nodes. One of the things we've done is we have made it very efficient for node addition to happen. So, uh, so the new cluster gets constituted really fast. So we will make sure that there is not as much, uh, much of a glitch in the transaction load as the node comes on or a node drops. Uh, to some extent, the node add addition is harder than a node dropping, actually, if you think about it. Yes? No. We have a fixed set of partitions in the system. That was the question earlier. So if we had to do larger clusters, you would have to start with a larger partition number. So when you add a node, the number of partitions are still the same in the system. They just get mapped differently. Uh, so you don't increase the number of partitions when you add a node. The mapping will change, exactly. When the mapping changes, then we, that is exactly what, what we are trying to say here, is the mapping changes. So that change of the mapping happens in a very short amount of time. All the cluster nodes agree on the mapping. And then what happens is that is the current state of the cluster in terms of the partitions, and that is the new state of the cluster where all the data has to go. Now, that's what we call as migrations or data rebalancing. So we schedule a bunch of partition movements around the system. So if in this case, right, if there are three, there's a three node cluster, and then there's a fourth node which is added, one fourth of the data of the number of partitions in the system have to move from, you know, uh, these three nodes into the fourth node. That way you get, a, you know, 25% of it each. 
you know, in the various places. So that is basically the work that, that, that starts to happen. And the important thing is, you got to do that while the partition, well, while you're ac handling reads and writes from the partitions wherever they are. And that's kind of the tricky part is, you have the current map, and you have the new map, and then, so the client, you know, I'll talk about it in a second, uh, keeps track of where everything is, because the cluster knows where everything is, it shares it with the client, so you're able to efficiently move, move it over. Yeah, the question was, will the rights continue to happen during rebalancing? The answer is yes. Everything continues to happen during rebalancing. Nothing stops an error spike ever. Things could slow down. You may have a little extra latency, but you can plan it, you know. During rebalancing, you will have, you will pay a little price in terms of the response times. But you can keep it under control by balancing the priorities of the data migration. You can make the data migration priority slower, lower, so that the migration will take longer time and you'll get better latency, you know. Question here? Yes. That's a very good point. No, it is not. And that is very important because uh, if you actually wait until you flush to disk, we can actually provide the same amount of throughput, but your latency will actually not be uh, good enough. And we can do that. I mean, it's not something we've, we've been asked to do that. The, so, so by default, it is right to yes. memory. On both copies, that's important. There is no durability if you write to memory on one copy. Durability that. The D of acid doesn't work unless you write multiple copies. So, so I can go ahead and No. We don't do it today. It is something we could do, but, but every time we've had a discussion on this, including with financial services, uh, I've been able to convince them, and it's not me, it's like Mike Stonebreaker, if you guys are familiar with databases, there is this whole case safety thing. So you can at some point show that if you want to have more durability, have three copies. Because the odds of all three of the nodes dying uh, at the same time when that, e that particular data has not gone to disk on any of them is infinitesimally. So I just, it starts going down. With two, it drips quite a bit. With three, I think it's pretty much non existent. Oh, that's. Well, the interesting thing about our key is there is nothing to be done because it's a function. You take any key, you give me a key. I can tell you what the digest is, and the client can do it, the server can do this, a, a backup tool can do this, there is no, it's just based on a function. So one-way hash function, that's an IPMD 160. It's a very robust hash function. And that's what we do. Yes. Yes. We move the partition data around. Is that the question, or do you not understand? No, we do move it. That's the whole um, uh, thing here is, as soon as the new node comes, the cluster is alive, reads and writes, transactions continue, but we are, we are moving the partitions along. Okay? And we, have, we published a paper on this in VLDB a couple of years, three years ago, I think, explaining this. One of the key things about Aerospike, which we um, discovered very early, was it's important to have a smart client. Okay, it is very, very important, you know, when you have a client that there's exactly one hop between the client and the node where the data is. That, so in steady state, when, when there is no flux, so partitions have all moved and the cluster is stable, Aerospike scales linearly. You can just prove it. There's nothing which will be in the way. The only thing which will get in the way is the amount of network uh, bandwidth you have and so on. So in terms of software, it just scales linearly. Now the trick is, when you add a node and remove a node, the trick is to make sure that you give enough capacity to the system so things can actually stabilize and come to steady state as soon as they, you know, as fast as they can. So that's kind of the, the tough algorithms there. And it's all about real-time prioritization. We patented a bunch of stuff there. But the, the map, the partition map, there are two protocols between the client and the server. One is a data protocol, which goes really fast. Uh, another one is an info protocol, as we call it, it's a, where the, the server and the client uh, exchange information. Uh, the server actually exchanges information with the client, um, saying here is where all the partitions are. And what happens then is it's really important for the client to, to get that information uh, fairly soon, but not instantaneously. So it, it, it does it probably once in two seconds or once in a second. That's good enough. Uh, in the time when the client doesn't have the right partition information, it can send the request to any node in the cluster. Since the cluster has the right information, it can proxy the request, as we call it, and send the uh, request to the other 
other node to fetch the data. It will be more expensive because there is an extra hop. If everything were a proxy, then that will become, a, you know, that will create a bottleneck. So we try to kind of get it out, get out of the proxy mode as soon as possible. Okay. Um, Another key thing about Aerospike, right? If you think about the key contributions of Aerospike, you know, you can uh, divide it into three or four things. One is flash optimization. The other one is the clustering I talked about, you know, um, and there are, there are more we will talk about in a second. But, but this, this is an extremely important thing. So if you look at flash, adding flash to any database makes the database go a few times faster. People do that with Oracle, people have MySQL, you can do that with Mongo, you can do that with any database, okay? Uh, so what is it that Aerospike did which was different? What we did, what we realized, you know, when Flash started coming, you know, uh, coming, you know, people started using it uh, about five years ago, what we realized was we could rewrite the data layer of a database to make it go a hundred times faster than existing traditional databases, okay? So we went and invested a bunch of time in, in making sure that, um, you know, we added a whole bunch of parallel things. This whole slide isn't showing well. Uh, but there are, all, all we are saying here is the current database has a file system, a page cache, a block interface going to SSDs and rotational, okay? So, so the current database system has a whole bunch of, um, you know, stuff in it to make it work well when the disks are really, really slow. So the whole idea of the traditional database kind of architecture is to try to get it into memory and then do operations on it. Okay, so what we realized was if we would actually architect the database in a parallel way, we can execute directly out of SSDs, you know, based on, you know, using our parallel algorithms. Now, once you do that, what you get is you get a hundred times faster system. It, you know, it, it is not like magic. You know, there are algorithms involved and so on. And that is what we see in terms of our lead. When I talk to you about performance and why we are so much better, if you look at the other NoSQL, everybody says we are, we are an order of magnitude faster, so much faster than traditional databases. All true. Okay? But we are an order of magnitude faster than that because we just re redid the whole thing. And that's kind of what I think you should, you know, take away from this. Okay. So, and there's an interesting side effect for, for being high performance on SSDs. Because SSDs have a cost advantage, uh, so you actually end up getting systems, you know, it's again hard to see here, but this is a $2 million system with mean memory, and then this is only about a $260,000 system. And this was actually done by one of our customers. Uh, so you can actually get 10 times cheaper deployment at 10 times higher scale. The kind of founding principle of Aerospike was that we would build technology so that people other than Google will be able to reach Google scale without putting in the effort that Google had to do in the first place. That's what this is. And this is not us. This is basically the industry produced SSDs. Billions of dollars of investment has gone into this. We've written software to leverage them to the best possible way. And we already have like three or four customers in our kind of, uh, who reached Google scale, like AppNexus, for example, Excelate. You know, there are a whole bunch of people over the last four years who've used this kind of technology. There, there is no economic way such companies could reach that scale and compete with, well, while Google and Facebook are going at the same time. So that's, I think, you know, a important enabler. And there are a bunch of companies in India which have done that, you know, in Mobi, you know, uh, Snapdeal, uh, you know, they're all kind of uh, benefiting from this kind of uh, technology because that's what they are. They're all about. Snapdeal is going to be like huge, right? You know, going forward, like Alibaba or whatever. You know, Flipkart's going to do the same thing. But all of them are going to need technology like this to speed up their deployments. Otherwise, you lose your customers. I mean, you just can't afford that. Uh, so what can you do with all this stuff? Okay, a few slides on what you can do. You can do one million transactions per second. You know, I think Raj sitting out there is just, you know, there's a blog coming out, you know, and on Monday. You know, Raj is one of our uh, key engineers at Bangalore. You know, he's, you know, he's a performance expert. You might want to talk to him, you know, in one of the breaks. Uh, you know, ask him how he got the one million TPS on, on a single server. You know, and this is something which we continue to work on. You know, performance is something that's very important. But more importantly is with native Flash, that the first slide I showed you, one million was in memory. Now in Flash, we are, you know, this is actually an older slide. I think we have a revised slide, right, Raj, coming out, um, you know, on Monday, you can look at it. But you can see we are, we are an order of magnitude better than other databases. You know, we have like Mongo, Couch, Cassandra, and so on. But the important thing is not the fact that we are big, better. It, it is by definition based on what we did, okay? The important thing is this one. The latency of the thing at high, high, high throughput is a hallmark of Aerospike. 
You run Aerospike, you will get that kind of flat latency day in and day out, month after month, year after year, and as a, as a node goes down, there'll be a little glitch, and it'll just stick to it. And that's hard. That's based on real-time prioritization algorithms and so on, which we had to do to make that happen. Okay? Ar you know, arguably, we have made it on a simple API, which is key value, which, which is where we started. We wanted to make sure we got the platform right. We didn't want to go and do a whole bunch of APIs at the same time as getting the platform right. Now that we have the platform right, I'm going to talk about the analytics portions. Now, this one I'm probably going to skip because you probably, you know, all this is saying is you can actually run a system, you know, uh, which essentially goes, and then you take a node out, and the other nodes immediately take over the, the basic uh, transactions. And this is something we can do seamlessly. Let's go a little bit into analytics, okay? So, so far I've talked about uh, how can you do uh, read-write transactions, you can do data rebalancing, you know, we also do, you know, fast writes using a log-structured file system and do defragmentation on the back end. So how can you do high-throughput reads and writes on a system and never stop, right? Now, can you do more than that, okay? It's something, you know, over the last year and a half, that's basically what we've been doing. The, the original things I talked about so far are about four years old. But for the last year and a half, we worked on adding, um, you know, features like this, secondary indexes. Okay. You cannot actually build queries without uh, efficient secondary indexes. I mean, you could do a scan, uh, but that's really not a query. You know, what happens is if you look at the database literature from the beginning, uh, indexing is always, always better than brute force parallelism. Okay? It's kind of a given. Because uh, there are, this is not like everybody is interested in every aspect of data that is in the system. Each query is interested in a certain aspect of it. If you could be, you know, uh, a little, you know, if you could plan a little and build the index on the things that are most interesting for your applications, then you always win. However, many times you're not able to think through what are these important things that you want to query. So you should be able to build indexes on the fly. So if, but it will take, so let's say you thought of a query, you know, to do, instead of scanning the database for a day, you could build the index for a day, and then you could reuse that index over and over again every day after that, or every, every second after that, for, for all we know. So that's kind of the trade-off, okay? So what we do, we do all the standard things. You know, what are the hard things to do? All the same things I talked about for, uh, for primary keys, right? Uh, so we, you know, we keep the index in memory, you know, the rotation, you know, the data on, on you know, uh, on disk, as far, you know, that's the whole SSD kind of, um, Innovation we talked about, but in this case, secondary index is also stored in DRAM, um, and and, it, and you have to make sure that the index is data balanced across the cluster. And the interesting thing is, uh, our data is distributed using a hash table, which means that it's already balanced really well with a robust hash function. So we co-locate the secondary index with every node, which means uh, in order to run the query, we would send the query to every node, and each one will execute it locally, which means you can, you get the benefit of parallelism. So this indexing is therefore optimized or what are called low selectivity indexes or high cardinality indexes. So you, you do a query on the secondary index, you'll get a number of records coming back. If it is just one-to-one, -one, then you can actually do a better job using the primary index scheme that we have. So just so you know, that's what it's optimized for. So parallel processing works really well. Uh, indexing data is co-located, as I mentioned. And we also guarantee assets. And the interesting thing is because it's co-located on the same node, we can guarantee you a consistency thing there, which, which you know, otherwise it's, it's hard. Again, I talked a little bit about low selectivity index queries. So you make a query on the system. The query is sent to every node in, in the cluster. And then at that point, uh, each of those nodes gets the data back. It sends it back to the client, and the client puts it together. And the interesting thing is, if you have multiple SSDs per node, uh, then we can read these things in parallel. So if you think of, think of it, there are multiple cores in, in, in the machine, the multiple, uh, you know, Disks in the machine, all of them go in parallel. So if you had to get, let's say, a million keys back, and if you had like 10 node cluster with a 10 node SSD, you, you just basically get, you know, a 100 way parallelism right there. Okay? Uh, SQL and NoSQL, okay? Uh, here's the interesting thing. So everybody goes, it's a NoSQL database. Right? What, what, is, what exactly does it mean? So we use NoSQL too, but uh, the way we, we, we are not, we, SQL is just a query language we can add on top of any database, frankly. Um, so if anything, the, the new branch of, you know, all the NoSQL databases, all they're saying is the original traditional databases, which happen to be relational, uh, have not actually redone their data layers and their platforms in such a way that they can provide much higher performance with the newest technology in terms of cores, in terms of SSDs, in terms of everything else, you know, networking. You know, all of that is what all of the NoSQL group has been doing. SQL happens to be, a, a, you know, just a query language. From our point of view, uh, we can do 
uh, SQL like queries using the system I just talked about. You know, we're going to have a workshop this afternoon, uh, you know, uh, where we will talk about how you write these queries. Uh, and, and, you know, and we use Lua as a programming language, you know, as a user-defined function with which you can write these various MapReduce functions or other kinds of, you know, aggregation functions. You know, you can do, you know, as, as, this, as this particular slide shows, you can kind of, uh, you know, use a secondary index. You can do a range query, you know, uh, on, on, on time if you want. You can actually do, you know, um, all kinds of arbitrary group buys, order buys, offsets, whatever you want to do. I mean, because you just write Lua code and then use the secondary index to limit the amount of data which comes in, do your processing locally on each node. The data is sent to the client, which is another final step of processing to kind of, you know, for group by, for example, you're going to have to sell all the, all the groups to the client before you do the final merge, and then you get the answer. Yes. The que yeah, yeah. yeah, the question is, uh, do the secondary indexes have to be created? Uh, using a separate tool or a management. So what we have is a way to go to the database and uh, ask it, you know, as a command, say, create an index, just like you have in a normal relational database. Uh, and then we will create the index dynamically uh, in the background. And then once, once all of the nodes have created the index, uh, the system knows when that has happened, it will make the index available, and then you can query it. It will tell you, okay, the index is now available, and we can run a query against it. So it's dynamic completely. That's okay. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, what happens when we started building an index and more data is coming in? Uh, what happens when you start building the index, the system, uh, first of all, starts a scan um, in order to make sure that it kind of builds the index on all the nodes, all, all the records in the database. At the same time, it also turns a bit somewhere saying this index is available for writing. So every time, um, uh, essentially, a, an update happens, uh, the system will actually create that index entry also at the same time. So at, by the time the scan is completed, all the, so the, essentially the, the uh, once you start the index build, all updates since then will actually be properly represented in the index. So, and, and once the scan completes the entire database, you may actually rescan the, uh, the same record for which uh, you just added an index entry, and then we will make sure we reconcile all that. So the system does that. So at the end of the scan, your index is live. The final join happens in the client, has to happen in the client, because that's an interesting thing there. You could actually do it some in, in one node in the cluster, but what if, again, I go back to the hotspot thing I said, I can guarantee you, you will create a hotspot. So, so it's better to do it uh, outside the cluster, because our cluster cannot afford to ever, ever go down because of a hotspot. So we choose to do local processing on each node, and we don't necessarily gather all the data from every other node into one cluster node, because that becomes now special, it's doing more work, it'll start slowing down. So we don't do that. We just keep it extremely well distributed. If every node is heavily loaded, I think you're okay. If one node is heavily loaded and everybody else is light, you have a problem because you don't know when the next thing is going to hit. So we avoid that. So that, therefore, we do all of the, the final step is always done on the client. Okay. Five minutes, okay. Um, so maybe go through a few more slides. You know, the one thing I want to say is we are not a column database. That's why this slide exists. So people go, you do analytics, do you do? No, we don't. We are row-based. Uh, I think we believe we can do a lot of interesting queries using row-based algorithms. Some of these we're going to go over this afternoon. You now, here's an anal analytics query. You know, this, is, this looks like SQL, you know, but it is uh, a wrapper. As I said, SQL is just a query language. You can just take SQL and convert it into Java. That's what we've done here. We take a SQL kind of uh, string and, and we generate Java and then we execute, uh, you know, a query on it. Uh, for example, you know, we will show this afternoon uh, how do you run uh, a query where you find, you know, you took a whole bunch of airline uh, data saying when flights showed up uh, on, and then find out which of the airlines had on-time arrival or late flights. So you can do those kinds of queries using, uh, and it ran, it ran in about 0.5 seconds. Uh, I think we probably need to improve that even more. So, but we will. Pardon? For the workshop, do you need internet access, Sunil? Do you need internet access for the workshop? 
do they need internet access? No. Answer is no, I guess. Yes, we do, we do that. We have special threads for things which return more versus less. Yes. We have to. In fact, that's one of the things we found. Raj is smiling there. I remember Raj and I staring at it once, one day, uh, maybe five months ago. Okay. So, only point here to make is you can do these analytics while the servers, while you're adding servers and rebalancing. So, all of the things I talked about for single record transactions also apply for analytics, okay. So, we are always on system. So, I'm going to skip past these less, the lessons thing, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll look at a couple of them, right. One of the things is like you've got to keep the architecture simple when you do any of these things because the problems you're solving are fairly complex. The last thing you want to do is also keep your architecture complex because that becomes another problem. So, this is, this is something we learned, you know, that this kind of tells you, you know, that just don't, you know, we use a DHT, you know, the whole uh, partition thing somebody asked, you know, we want to make sure it's fixed for the cluster and that actually simplifies a whole bunch of things. We want to make sure every node is identical. It enables you to make sure that, you know, the whole thing runs. When you add a node, there's no confusion. You know, this node is twice the capacity of the other one. You know, all of that goes away from an operational point of view and also an algorithm point of view. So, I mean, the one of the things which are, you know, sizing clusters properly is one thing I want to point out. You know, it is easy to make any system kind of perform poorly if you use it in a way it's not supposed to be used. And one of those is like, if you, if you have, so you want to make sure that you size the system fine, then it'll run forever. Um, I know, the one, only other thing I want to point out here is, you know, uh, two things I guess. Have planned for unforeseen situations. Everything that you've done running a service, I think everything you know, everything I know is going to be wrong on, on pretty much in a, in a day fairly soon in the future. <laughs> so, you might as well keep your mind open and try to plan as much as possible. But also use the right data management tool for the job. And one of the things, you know, I want to emphasize is Aerospike is uh, not Hadoop. Okay, Aerospike is for real-time data, read-write data. You can do analytics on the real-time real read-write data. You don't want to misuse it to actually put a whole bunch of data in Aerospike and then do a scan. We probably will be faster than something like, you know, than Hadoop, but it doesn't matter. Because what is the difference between like 12 hours and 3 hours? You know, it's still hours, right? What we want to do is things which are within a second, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're actually doing something really substantial, you know, or within milliseconds in terms of read-write transactions. So, use the right tool for the, for the job. Uh, I'll skip past this. This is just saying what, what does the architecture look like. Um, and here are a list of features we basically have, you know, talk about, you know, you can basically, we talk a little bit about it in the workshop this afternoon, so I can probably skip this. Well, thank you for attending this on a Saturday. So. <laughs>